I have a sort of semi-fictional list of the top 20 poems ever written in the English language. It's not really definitive, I've never written it down, but uh, this poem by Wilfred Owen from World War I, Dolce et Decorum Est, is without question, I think, one of the top 20 poems written in the world. If for no other reason, because of its fantastic use of imagery, and the fact that it is kind of a double sonnet, it's two sonnets kind of jammed together with an amazing transition in the middle. Um, the poem is worth studying, whether we were studying the sonnet unit or not, um, and I want to start by uh, emphasizing how amazing it is in its structure, and then sort of get into its imagery a little bit. Um, the poem dramatizes, of course, a gas attack. Um, this might be a good image of what to see when you read the poem. You know, I know it's kind of blurry, but soldiers all over the ground, soldiers with blindfolds on, they've had a gas attack. Um, and this poem depicts sort of like the second gas attack, if you will. They've already, they're already in a bad place when the poem opens, these World War I soldiers, and then they get gassed um, maybe for a second time. Uh, the poem is written in uh, mostly a Shakespearean rhyme scheme, you know, what, the interlocking ABAB. Um, and let's just read the rhymes at the ends of lines so that uh, you can see how amazing this poem is, particularly in that uh, it, the title, of course, is uh, Latin, um, referring to the great Roman Empire. Um, nobody loved more, more than the Romans did. Um, and this is sort of an anti-war poem, so it's kind of taking to task some of the gushing about war that the Romans did. The title means, uh, you know, dulce, some of us know this from Spanish, right? It sort of means sweet. Um, it's sweet and decorous, it is sweet and appropriate, it is sweet and right to die for one's country. Um, and that's the last line of the poem, and what's so amazing about it is that he doesn't obey all the rules, you know, Wilfred Owen doesn't always have a full line of iambic pentameter, you know, it's sort of fragmented. As we move down through the poem, you can see that it sort of gets shorter, some of the lines get shorter as they go, um, like bitter is the cud. But that fragmentation seems to work with the poem quite well um, because it's sort of a poem of you know, destruction and death. So uh, let's just read the rhyme scheme first to appreciate how beautiful this poem is written. Um, and so that when you hear the words fit into the actual rhythm and meter and meaning of the poem, it's, it's doubly impressive. Um, Sacks sludge, backs trudge. Boots blind, hoots behind. Fumbling time, stumbling line, light drowning. Sight drowning. Notice that he repeats the word drowning twice. Um, you know, that's sort of cheating. You know, it's not actually rhyming, it's using the same word, but it actually is because right here in the center of the poem is sort of this magical, I, I guess I would call it the, the volta of the poem, um, where it changes. Uh, everything. The whole poem turns from just pure description of the gas attack uh, to what the gas attack and the memory of that gas attack means to the speaker of our poem, Wilfred Owen, who did die in World War I. Um, he wrote this uh, when he was injured on the battlefield and was in the hospital. He and several other soldiers would write poems and kind of publish a literary magazine called Hydra in which this poem was found. So we just finished the first sonnet, Drowning, Drowning. Let's do the last one. Pace in, face sin, blood lungs, cud tongues, zest glory, est mori. Um, that's what's so amazing about the poem is that he rhymes zest with est, an English word with a Latin word, and glory with mori. But uh, we'll have to come back to those. Um, the last word of the poem, of course, is to die. Um, let's look at the incredible imagery of this poem. You know, uh, it's very physical. You know, it opens with bent double. Um, these soldiers are weak and sick and fatigued and injured. And he uses a simile in the first line as well, where he compares them to old beggars under sacks. Let's just read the first quatrain. Bent double, like old beggars under sacks, knock kneed coughing like hags, we curse through sludge, till on the haunting flares we turned our backs and toward our distant rest began to trudge. So we have a simile. They're compared to old beggars under sacks, which makes them seem pathetic and desperate. Uh, they are physically described, bent, doubled, and knock kneed. We have auditory imagery that we can hear them hacking because they've experienced gas attacks. And we notice that our narrator is involved in this. You know, he is the he is a speaker. Um, he doesn't say I, he says we. 
Um, he is part of the army unit. They are cursing through sludge. Again, we are hearing them cursing. Till on the haunting flares we turned our backs and toward our distant rests began to trudge. Trudge is such a good word for diction because it implies a sort of shuffling of their feet as they're moving um, through the battlefield, through the no man's land. Um, we see a lot of visual imagery as well where we can imagine the flares sort of haunting if you've watched the movie 1918 and the ninth scene where he's moving through the city, we can kind of see those flares. We uh, see a use of brevity, if you will, we have just three words, right? He says, men marched asleep. In the middle of the line, he stops the sentence. We're so used to long lines in a sonnet that this short line sticks out. And we realize, um, you know, what misery these men are in, that they're marching asleep. And we could say that uh, there is beauty in this terribly disturbing poem in that, you know, it has slight decorations with that alliteration there. Men marched asleep. Many had lost their boots but limped on bloodshod. This is practically Anglo-Saxon, you know, sort of Beowulfish, but um, they do not have shoes, and um, as I read in one Holocaust memoir, death begins in the feet. If you lose your shoes, you're pretty much done for. Um, these men, they are not wearing uh, shoes that are shod with leather. Their feet are bloodshod. They're wearing shoes of blood, is how he describes it. All went blame, lame, all blind, drunk with fatigue, deaf even to the hoots of gas shells dropping softly behind. So suddenly, we end up with action, right? This is fairly unusual for a sonnet, which we've seen to be mostly lyrical, you know, uh, emotional declarations. But here we have a story, something's happening. The men are already in a bad way, and they are so tired that they are deaf to the hoots. Again, we have an auditory image of the gas shells dropping behind. And suddenly, we are in the gas attack, right? We have the use of exclamation points. We almost hear the man crying out, there's gas, so you need to get your gas mask on. Gas, gas, all caps, quick boys, an ecstasy of fumbling, fitting the clumsy helmets just in time. But someone still was yelling out and stumbling and floundering like a man in fire or lime. Another time we see a simile um, where uh, there's a lot of green in the poem to me. I associate the green with the green gas mask and the green gas itself. This ecstasy of fumbling. Um, you know, this idea of just ru rushing around trying to get the mask ready. And they're clumsy and they're big. You've seen what they look like. And they're fitting the clumsy helmets just in time. That almost makes us think, oh, they did it. They got it. They're fitting the clumsy helmets just in time. But someone still was yelling out and stumbling. So he's yelling and stumbling and floundering like a man in fire or lime. It looks like he's on fire. Um, lime is something sticky that um, sticks to you. Dim through the misty panes and thick green light, as under a green sea, I saw him drowning. Drowning here is literal, I mean, um, is figurative, right? He's not literally drowning as in water, but he is, you know, not able to breathe as you're not able to breathe underwater. And so he uses the word drowning twice um, to emphasize, you know, the metaphor of there's no, there's no oxygen for him to breathe. Uh, we see this as past tense. I saw him drowning. So our, our speaker witnesses this guy not get his gas mask on time. And we have this transition. This is sort of the magic welding together of two sonnets. He says, in all my dreams. This is what we probably typically say a PTSD poem. This is a post-traumatic stress disorder poem. That he is like, even when he sleeps in all his dreams, before my helpless sight, there's nothing I can do. That idea of helpless really adds to the power of the, the noun sight. In all my dreams before my helpless sights, he plunges at me. Notice this is present tense. He plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning. Three terrible verbs, right? That's kind of the story part of the, the poem. It gives us a, a setting and a scene and something that happens. And this is the present tense, I'm still haunted by him. And then the poem changes quite a lot because he addresses someone. Our speaker, the survivor who survived the gas attack, says, if in some smothering dreams, you know, we have the word dreams repeated again, these dreams make me feel like I can't breathe, you too could pace behind the wagon that we flung him in. So the guy is so sick, they fling him into the wagon. So the story kind of continues, but at the same time, he is speaking to somebody. A lot of times people think that he is speaking to um, an elementary school teacher who's telling 
his uh, students, like in a little circle, about the glories of war. Because this poem is about a takedown of the glories of death and war. I often have to say to students, this is not a poem that's saying that there's not a such thing as noble sacrifice and patriotism, or that it's not sacrificial to die for your country. The, the poet is angry that somebody has the nerve to say it's beautiful to die for your country. He's like, it is not beautiful. Um, World War I is famously, of course, the war in which we say never such innocence again, quoting the poet Philip Larkin. But he's talking to this guy. He says, it's, I've always loved this part of the poem. He says, if you could be like us, if you could experience what I did and pace behind the wagon that we flung him in, if you could watch the white eyes writhing in his face, what a terrible verb, writhing his face, his hanging face, like a devil sick of sin. Another simile in the poem, he looks like a devil who's sick of sin. This is all visual imagery. If you could pace behind it, if you could see his white eyes writhing in his face because he's in such great pain, if you could hear. I've always thought it's interesting that it starts with visual and then goes to hearing. If you could hear at every jolt, the blood come gargling from the froth corrupted lungs, bitter as the cut of vile and curable sores on innocent tongues. Every time they hit a jolt on the wagon, um, something, you know, um, I don't know, horrible junk <laughs> comes out of the man's mouth, probably his lungs dissolving. Um, they come gargling out of his froth corrupted lungs. And we have one more simile. It is bitter as the cut of vile and curable sores on innocent tongues. It's a, it's a terrible thing to witness. Um, we have this sort of ironic addressing to the person he's talking to. Like I said, probably the elementary school teacher. He says, if you could watch him in the wagon, if you could hear his lungs coming out of his mouth, my friend, you would not tell with such high zest to children ardent for some desperate glory, the old lie, dulce et decorum est, pro patria mori. How sweet and beautiful it is to die for one's country. He calls it, you know, holding no punches, pulling no punches, the old lie. Um, he doesn't think that it's true because what he's experienced in the war has made him see how awful um, mechanized warfare is. So what an amazing poem filled with such unbelievably powerful imagery, starting with a narrative, turning into admitting that he's haunted by this narrative, and then anger it ends with anger and accusation toward the naivete of the home front and the people who aren't on the battlefield and what they can't understand and can't see about their sort of glib, easy slogans about the war.